Hey there friends, it's Midnight Fears, calling you back into the shadows. Today, brace yourselves for some spine-chilling tales, creepy neighbor scary stories are here. This is a real story, and everything I'm about to share is true. It's the first time I've felt the need to tell it, but I can't keep it to myself any longer. I had just moved into a cozy little house in what I thought was a quiet, unassuming neighborhood. The previous tenant had left in a hurry, which worked to my advantage the rent was affordable, and I was eager to start anew after a tumultuous couple of years. Everything seemed perfect, at least until I noticed him the old man across the street. From the first day, I felt his eyes on me. He would stand at his window all day, unmoving, his gaze fixed directly on my front door. I tried to dismiss it as a quirk of old age or loneliness. Maybe he enjoyed looking out the window and I just happened to be in his line of sight. I waved once, attempting a neighborly gesture, but he didn't respond. His expression didn't change, nor did his stare waver. A few weeks into my new life, the unease that had settled in the pit of my stomach became a tangible threat. It started with a package I found on my doorstep one evening after work. It was addressed to me but had no return address. Inside, there were photographs, dozens of them, each one a picture of me, taken from various angles inside my house. The photos were detailed, showing me doing mundane things, cooking, watching TV, even sleeping. Each photograph was dated, and as I shuffled through them, a horrifying realization dawned on me. Every timestamp corresponded exactly to those moments when I felt his penetrating gaze the strongest, the times I'd pause and look out my window only to meet his eyes across the street. Panicked, I called the police. They came and took a statement, looked at the photos, and agreed to talk to the old man. But when they crossed the street, they found the house eerily silent and empty. Dust coated the surfaces, and cobwebs hung like curtains. The officers told me it looked as if no one had lived there for months. Confused and scared, I insisted on showing them the man at the window, but when I pointed out, the figure was gone. The following days were a blur of sleepless nights and anxious glances across the street. I installed curtains and blinds, but the sense of being watched never left. I started researching the house's history, desperate for answers. The local library held old newspaper archives, and that's where I found an article that chilled me to the bone. Years ago, the article explained, there lived an old man who was obsessed with the previous occupants of my house. He was described as reclusive and eccentric, known for his invasive watching and documenting of his neighbors' lives. One day, he simply vanished, leaving all his belongings behind. The article included a photo of him, and it was undoubtedly the man I had seen. As days turned into weeks, the photograph stopped arriving, but the damage was done. I couldn't shake the feeling of being observed from the shadows. I installed security cameras, but they never caught anything unusual. Neighbors mentioned occasionally seeing shadows or movements in the old man's house at night, but nothing that could be clearly made out. Eventually I moved out, unable to bear the constant feeling of eyes on me. The last I heard, the new tenant had also left abruptly, the house remaining empty, a silent sentinel across the street. Now, when I think about that house, about the old man who should not have been there, I realize some places hold onto their pasts, their secrets. And sometimes those secrets watch you, unseen, from just across the street. I moved into a quaint neighborhood with tidy homes and well-kept lawns, the epitome of suburban bliss. My house, although modest, boasted one particularly charming feature, its proximity to Mrs. Whitaker's garden. Mrs. Whitaker, my next door neighbor, was an elderly woman known throughout the community for her impeccable garden, 
a tapestry of vibrant colors and intoxicating scents that seemed almost otherworldly. From the day I moved in, Mrs. Whitaker, with her warm smile and twinkling eyes, took it upon herself to welcome me. She often invited me to walk through her garden, proudly showing off rows of meticulously cared for flowers and plants. My curiosity about her gardening success was piqued, not just by the beauty of her blooms, but also by her secretive, almost reverent mention of her unique fertilizer. One cool evening, driven by a mix of intrigue and an inexplicable unease, I decided to explore her garden further. Mrs. Whitaker had gone inside for the night, and under the cover of dusk, I felt emboldened to venture beyond the usual paths we walked together. Tucked away behind a cluster of thick bushes, I found a small, secluded patch of earth that I had never noticed before. It was oddly separate from the rest of the garden, surrounded by high hedges that cast deep shadows even under the moonlight. As I approached, a metallic scent filled the air, pungent and unsettling. My hands trembled slightly as I brushed aside some loose soil, revealing what was hidden beneath. What I uncovered there, in the quiet obscurity of that hidden garden corner, were small bones, small, unmistakably human bones. The soil around them was loose, suggesting they had been buried recently. Horror gripped me as I realized that the special fertilizer misses Whitaker had spoken of was not just an eccentric old wives' tale, but a gruesome reality. Panic set in, and I hurriedly covered the bones, my mind racing with ghastly images and possibilities. That night, I lay awake, every creak and whisper of the house a signal of looming dread. By morning, my decision was made I could not ignore what I had seen. I called the police, my voice barely a whisper as I recounted my discovery. The investigation that followed revealed the darkest chapters of Mrs. or Whitaker's life. The bones were identified as belonging to several missing persons, dating back decades. Mrs. Whitaker was arrested, her frail appearance and sweet demeanor doing nothing to shield her from the consequences of her actions. It emerged that her family's secret involved luring unsuspecting travelers from the nearby highway, their remains used to nourish the soil of her beloved garden. The community was left reeling from the revelation, a chilling reminder that evil can lurk behind the most serene facades. As for me, I moved away shortly after, unable to bear the sight of the garden that had once seemed a paradise, but was now nothing more than a beautiful graveyard. My nights are still haunted by the memory of that evening the scent of the earth, the sinister rustle of the leaves, and the dreadful truth about the perfect garden next door. It was 2021 when the unsettling echoes began in my apartment complex in the heart of the city. My unit was one of many stacked together in a building that had seen better days. Sounds traveled easily through the thin walls, and over time I had grown accustomed to the symphony of city life that played around me. That was until the noises next door became impossible to ignore. Initially, it was just muffled conversations that seeped through the adjoining wall of my bedroom snippets of daily exchanges that seemed ordinary. Gradually, these sounds began to change in nature. The dialogues turned into arguments, the arguments into shouting matches, and eventually the shouting dissolved into horrifying screams and desperate pleas that shattered the stillness of the night. This progression wasn't slow, it happened over the course of a few weeks. Driven by a mix of concern and terror, I called the police. The intensity of the screams made me fear for the safety of whoever was next door. When the officers arrived, they were quick to act, their knocks urgent against the door of the adjacent apartment. There was no answer, but the screaming had ceased the moment their sirens had echoed in the street below. What they found, or rather, didn't find was chilling. The apartment was completely empty. Dust lay thick on the furniture, 
and a stack of unopened mail by the door suggested no one had been there for months. The officers were perplexed, but decided it must have been a sound system left on, or perhaps a prank. They left, advising me to record the noise if it happened again. That very night, the screaming resumed. This time, however, amid the cries, I heard my name being called out, clear and unmistakable. The voice was distorted with pain and fear, calling to me as if from a great distance, yet it was undeniably coming from the apartment next door. My blood ran cold, the room felt suddenly oppressive, the air thick with a sense of imminent danger. Sleep was impossible after that. The following morning, I approached the building manager, an elderly gentleman who had been looking after the complex for years. I inquired about the history of the apartment next door. His face turned a shade paler as he invited me into his cramped office, cluttered with maintenance tools and old building records. He told me that years ago, a young woman lived in that apartment. She had been in an abusive relationship and neighbors and authorities often dismissed her cries for help as domestic disturbances with no real danger. One day the cries stopped and she was never seen again. The boyfriend claimed she had left him and moved out, but nothing was proven and her family believed she had met a more sinister fate. After that, the apartment remained vacant, the memory of the woman seemingly fading into the past. The manager confessed that recent tenants had reported strange noises too, but he had never taken them seriously, attributing the sounds to the old pipes and creaky building structure. Armed with this knowledge, I felt a responsibility to uncover the truth. I spent nights awake, recording every sound, every whisper from the apartment next door. I scoured local archives and online records, piecing together the tragic story of the woman who had lived there. My search led me to contact her family, who were still tormented by her unresolved disappearance. Together we pressed for a more thorough investigation. This time the police were more diligent. They conducted a detailed search of the apartment and discovered a hidden compartment beneath the floorboards right against our shared wall. Inside, they found remnants of her belongings, along with a digital recorder that contained hours of audio her diary of sorts, documenting the horrors she, she had endured. The apartment was finally sealed off as a crime scene, and an investigation into her disappearance was reopened. The voices stopped after the discovery, as if her pleas for help had finally been heard. Though the apartment next door remains empty to this day, Sometimes, in the quiet of the night, I still hear the faint echo of her voice, a chilling reminder of the past that once haunted those rooms. I had always considered my neighbor, Mr. Adler, to be a bit of an oddball, a reclusive artist whose interactions with the outside world were as sparse as the thinning hair on his head. His house, always shuttered and dimly lit, emanated a mysterious aura that intrigued and unnerved the neighborhood in equal measure. Late at night, when most of our small town was asleep, I would often catch glimpses of him, a solitary figure leaving his home with an easel and a cluster of paints tucked under his arm. His destination was always the same, the dense, uninviting woods that bordered our street. His nightly escapades were the fodder for much local gossip, but remained shrouded in secrecy, as no one ever truly knew what he did in those woods. One night, driven by a potent mix of concern and raw curiosity, I decided to follow him. The moon was a mere sliver in the sky, casting meager light that barely penetrated the thick canopy of the woods. I tread softly, keeping a safe distance as Mr. Adler ventured deeper into the forest, his figure occasionally illuminated by the ghostly glow of his lantern. Finally, he stopped in a small clearing that I had never stumbled upon before. The area was oddly circular, with the trees around its edge standing like silent sentinels in the night. I watched, hidden behind a thick bush, 
Adler set up his easel and began to paint with feverish intensity. Curiosity soon overcame my caution, and I moved closer to see what he could possibly be painting at such a late hour. To my utter shock, his canvas was not made of fabric, but of bark the trunks of the trees themselves. And on each he feverishly created grotesque, lifelike faces. Some expressions were twisted in agony, their wooden eyes wide and mouths agape, as if caught in a silent scream. Others bore expressions of blissful serenity, their eyes closed and lips curved in peaceful smiles. Each face was hauntingly detailed, so vividly crafted that they seemed on the verge of speaking. The sound of a twig snapping under my foot betrayed my presence, and Mr. Adler turned to face me. His eyes, usually so dull and distant, were alight with a wild fervor. He didn't seem surprised to see me there, only pausing his work to wipe his paint hands on a ragged cloth. They watch over us now, he whispered in a tone that was neither menacing nor welcoming but matter of fact. His voice had a chilling finality to it, as if he had unveiled a profound truth that I was too naive to understand. Then, without another word, he turned back to his eerie task, his brush strokes deliberate and sure. I left the woods that night feeling a blend of fear and fascination. Over the following weeks, I noticed a change in the atmosphere of our street. The neighborhood was quieter, almost reverent, and even the animals seemed to avoid the path through the woods where Mr. Adler's tree faces kept their silent vigil. People started talking about feeling watched, though they couldn't pinpoint from where. Some mentioned dreams filled with faces in the trees whispering secrets in languages they couldn't understand. Others simply felt an unexplainable peace as they walked by the woods, a sense of being protected. Mr. Adler never spoke of that night, nor did he ever invite anyone to view his living gallery. When he passed away some years later, the faces gradually faded from the trees, worn away by time and weather. Yet, the legend of the night painter persists a tale told in hushed tones about the man who turned the woods into a sanctuary, a place where faces etched in bark watched over a small town, guarding its secrets and its silence. This story is real, every moment seared into my memory like a brand. Each night as I lay in my new ground floor apartment, a pattern emerged that set my nerves on edge. The building was old, with creaky bones and thin walls, allowing sounds to carry with unnerving clarity. Above me lived a quiet, middle-aged man who seemed to embody solitude. He was the kind of neighbor you hardly noticed, which in the city often meant a peaceful coexistence. But every night, Around 2 a.m., the predictable sound of his footsteps descending into his cellar would reach my ears. This was followed by a rhythmic thumping, like something or someone being dragged across the floor, ending in an eerie silence that stretched until dawn. The routine was unnerving, and my friends joked about my neighbor being a vampire or a mad scientist. As the weeks turned into months, my unease transformed into an obsessive need to uncover what was happening in that cellar. One chilly November evening, I summoned the courage to visit him under the guise of borrowing some mundane item a perfect ploy to gain entry. He opened the door with a mixture of surprise and reluctance, his eyes darting nervously as if to shield me from seeing too much. The apartment was sparse, the air stale. He agreed to lend me what I needed, but kept the cellar door, which was visible from the hallway, firmly locked. His obvious anxiety about the cellar piqued my curiosity further. As we chatted about trivial neighborhood matters, he excused himself to use the restroom. Seizing the opportunity, I slipped down to the cellar, my heart pounding in my chest. The door creaked ominously as I pushed it open revealing a cold, dimly lit staircase that descended into darkness. 
I flick the light switch and the bulb flickered to life with a reluctant hum. The cellar was chillingly methodical, lined with several large industrial freezers, their surfaces clean and unassuming. As I approached the nearest freezer, a mix of dread and adrenaline propelled me forward. I lifted the heavy lid and the rush of cold air that greeted me carried a nauseating realization. Inside, human limbs were stacked with clinical precision, each piece wrapped in plastic, labeled with dates and names a horrifying catalog of human butchery. The thumping I had heard each night was now horrifyingly clear the sounds of him dragging new additions to his collection. And panic overwhelmed me. I closed the freezer, my hands trembling, as I heard the bathroom faucet shut off upstairs. I raced back up the steps, my mind racing with terror and disbelief. I managed to maintain a veneer of calm as I thanked him and returned to my apartment. Once inside, I locked the door and dialed the police, my voice a whispered rush of urgent fear. They arrived within minutes, their presence a small comfort against the horror I had uncovered. The investigation that followed was swift and grim. My neighbor was arrested, revealed to be a longtime suspect in multiple disappearances across the state. The evidence I had accidentally stumbled upon brought his gruesome activities to an end. Living above that cellar, knowing what horrors it contained, haunts me. I moved out shortly after, but the images of that night linger, a stark reminder of the darkness that can lurk behind the mundane facade of everyday life. The quiet, the thumping, the silence, they were all pieces of a macabre puzzle that I had lived unknowingly alongside, a chilling echo of the monster that had been my neighbor.